Many things can't pass across the blood-brain barrier, but alcohol, because it's water and fat soluble, just cruises right across this fence into the environment of the brain. The poison, it will kill cells. Because of the structure of alcohol, it is both water soluble and fat soluble. What that means is when you drink alcohol, it can pass into all the cells and tissues of your body. It has no trouble just passing right into those cells. The fact that it can pass into so many organs and cells so easily is really what explains its damaging effects. I'd love to be able to tell you otherwise, but that's just a fact. When you ingest ethanol, it has to be converted into something else because it is toxic to the body, into something called acetylaldehyde. And if you thought ethanol was bad, acetylaldehyde is particularly bad. Acetylaldehyde is poison. It will kill cells. It damages and kills cells, and it is indiscriminate as to which cells it damages and kills. That's a problem, obviously, and the body deals with that problem by using another component of the NAD biochemical pathway to convert acetylaldehyde into something called acetate. What does that mean for you? <laughs> what that means is that if your body can't do this conversion of ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate fast enough, well, acetylaldehyde will build up in your body and cause more damage. It's important that your body be able to do this conversion very quickly. The place where it does that is within the liver. Cells within the liver are very good at this conversion process but they are cells and they are exposed to the acetylaldehyde in the conversion process. And so cells within the liver really take a beating in the alcohol metabolism events. Now, the important thing to understand is that it is the poison, the acetylaldehyde itself, that leads to the effect of being inebriated or drunk. In thinking about the biochemical effects of alcohol and what it's doing to the body, what it's doing in all cases is it's consumed into the gut, right? The liver immediately starts this conversion that we talked about before of ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate. And some amount of acetylaldehyde and acetate are making it into the brain. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. The brain has this fence around it that we call the blood-brain barrier or the BBB. Many things, most things, thankfully, can't pass across the blood-brain barrier, but alcohol, because it's water and fat soluble, just cruises right across this fence and into the milieu, the environment of the brain, which is made up of a couple different major cell types, neurons, nerve cells, and so-called glial cells, which are in between the nerve cells. So one of the first things that happens is that there's a slight suppression in the activity of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. This is an area of your neocortex that's involved in thinking and planning and perhaps above all in suppression of impulsive behavior. So people will say things that they want to say without so much forethought about what they're saying. Or they might do things that they want to do without really thinking it through quite as much, or they might not even remember thinking it through at all. We haven't talked about blacking out yet in the effects of alcohol on memory. But as long as we're there, I'll just tell you that alcohol has a very strong effect in suppressing the neural networks that are involved in memory formation and storage. This is why oftentimes we forget the events of a night out if we've been drinking. One of the more important things to know about the effects of alcohol in the brain is this that areas of the brain that are involved in flexible behavior, sort of considering different options, like I could do A or I could do B. I could say this to them or I could say that. I could say it in that way or I could say it in this way. This might be a little more tactful. Those brain areas basically shut down entirely and people just tend to say what they want to say. What's interesting is this is true in the short term, so after people have one or two, maybe three or four drinks, but it's also true that the more often that people drink, there are changes in the very circuits that underlie habitual and impulsive behavior. 